if you like betting on golf, but everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved, with all the stats and the tips and so much more, cause it's the golf betting system, the golf betting system, it's the golf betting system. Greetings, welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast. It's episode 279, this uh, 2023 Ryder Cup Bets Pod. Barry O'Hanrahan and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss our selection for this week's 44th Ryder Cup from Marco Simoni Golf and Country Club in Rome, Italy. Good morning, gents. Morning, guys. Morning, guys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gambler aware. You can visit gamblerware.org for more info. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world famous golf betting system website where we have in depth Ryder Cup betting statistics, many, many of which we will discuss on this pod. We're available on X. You can follow us. Barry is at golf, a good talk golf. Paul is at golf betting. I'm at Bamford golf. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts as ever for those of you who leave a review. I will read them out at the start of a future show, leave your name and where you are in the review. Now, we've received an absolute cracker here. It's long, but I'm going to read every word because it's such a good review. Uh, because the way it reads, I'm going to tell you uh, it's from Greg. He's in Lake Tahoe in California, USA. Title, the lads are well, are worth a listen, five stars. I'm relatively new to the podcast, but it has quickly become a must listen. The insights Steve, Paul and Barry provide are always factored in when filling out my betting card. Their weekly research, course previews and predictor models are in depth and well prepared. As far as I'm concerned, this podcast is second to none. The website is fantastic and quite user friendly, but... Listening to the podcast is a necessity, as you might be talked into a winner. The hosts themselves didn't back, open brackets, like Sepp Strucker at the John Deere Classic close brackets. Oh, I remember that one. The lads clearly enjoy it one another, which makes the podcast an enjoyable listen as you feel like you're chatting with your own buddies. I wish I could have joined them for a pint and some laughs at Wentworth. Their tips have been profitable in my experience. The boys have been... Put the boys have even put me onto each way bets, which aren't as popular here in the United States, but hopefully becoming more available. In fact, the only time I wish I worry is when we're all in agreement on a winner, as demonstrated by the finish at the Amiga Masters. The only way this podcast will end up on my post it note of doom is if they lose that delightful theme song I find myself singing throughout the week. Best of luck, gentlemen, and keep up the great work. Greg from California, thank you so much for that fantastic review. Much appreciated. Brilliant stuff. Yes, thanks, Greg. Lovely lovely to hear you getting some success out of your bets, and uh, longer may that continue. Nice one for that, Greg. Keep up the good work. Uh, yeah, keep them coming. As we said, it'd be great if we could hit 450 total by the RSM Classic DP World Tour Championship show, which I think is in five or six episodes' time. So if you're in America or in uh, the UK and Ireland, please throw us a five-star review. Even Canada, Australia, we've got we've got listeners all over the planet. Give, take some time and the, those five-star reviews, keep them trucking in. Right, I'm going to hand this part of the show over to you, Barry. Talk us through last week. <laughs> it wasn't good. I, I mean, I I made three three picks that went really well between start from the bottom, Olison, um, or Olison Brun, and then the protagonist in this story that has just terrorized me, um, Jordan Smith. For for all the world, looked like he had the tournament. Just you know, he just needed to put the trophy in his cabinet, um, and then on Sunday, just completely like forgot how to put 
it um it was one of the one of the hardest watches i've had um i woke up a little late into his mid- midway through the front line or the, actually the, the latter half of the front line after watching ireland beat south africa on um saturday night so i was a little bit dusty I had some. I had. I only had. I only put my bets on for wins last week. I, I don't know why. I just went for it. I just said it was. You know, felt easiest and cleanest. And Smith confidence. was about about confidence. There we go. But Smith was about twenty five. So I just you know I would. I'd rather put the stake money into the win and try catch mm. it that way than get a tiny little um, one fifty odds return. Um, my mistake was. Not mistake, but my situation led to me not laying him off. I didn't go into his own individual bet. I just went for the ca- the auto cash out because I had Brun up there. I set the cash out too high. I was a little bit greedy uh, on the exchange. And when I woke up, what had been Jordan Smith trading at 1.1 was not happening anymore. So you're kind of stuck with your bet then. And then I got to watch him miss, I don't know how many puts, I'm going through it here. I've uh, six putts under 10 foot already. Four mm. of them, well, three. <laughs> I haven't even got to the midway through the back nine yet. And I think Buried. I need to, I think, Punishing I think yourself. I, seven, there's, another, there's a seven foot two. I just need to stop. Um, <laughs> so there's lessons learned about um, laying off and just accepting you're going to lose a little bit of your equity when you make a bet on exchange and by laying off you've actually done well in a way mm. um the the other thing that hurt the most was the and i that's my own fault for not continuing to back him because he continued to play quite well from when i first picked him was rio hisatsune and wow did he hit yeah. the ball wow did he hit the ball well on the back nine or the back 11 holes he was or ten holes, sorry. Um, yeah, just so it's, it's just so good. Just there looked like there was the freedom in the swing that Jordan Smith could have, if he had had five percent of that in his putting stroke, he would have been fine. Um, mm. And on a, on a tough, challenging golf course, he went out there and knocked in six birdies in his last ten or uh, ten holes to to claim the win. It was it was brilliant. Really, really yeah. great performance. Another one of these kind of come from behind wins at um, at the Golf National, as per previous year, where where Guido came from way off the pace, didn't he, to to record that fantastic final round? But yeah, six birdies in his final ten holes for Rio, which um, impressive stuff. Hundred to one though, Barry, and I think you know, and Stop. I know you've been, <laughs> I know you've been backing him before, um, on and off over the last few few months, but. Yeah, miscut in Ireland, miscut at Wentworth last two starts, and I think you and everyone else could be forgiven for for looking at it and thinking, uh, you know, for looking at him and thinking, well, you know, should I back him? Can mm. I back him? He's coming to Le Golf National on um, course debut. Debutants haven't got a good record here, off the back of a couple of miscuts, you know, one that you can leave alone. Yet he found himself in the, you know, in the in the right kind of position all the way through the week to to do well um, you know, to put himself in, in with a chance and then you produce that kind of finish and so you produce that kind of round that just gets the uh, gets the job done but yeah I, I feel for you Barry because six shot lead for, for Smith um, early on in that final round and you'd, you'd expect and hope that he would convert that but I mean, that is a <sighs> that is a pretty precipitous fall from the top mm. he um I dug into the stats. I mean, there's a not a good account there. Matt SGT two green um, put out all the stats there on Twitter. He lost three point eight eight strokes gained putting on Sunday alone. Lost mm. one on Saturday too, which wasn't Saturday. There was quite a few putts that could have gone down too. It's um, yeah. I hate being a glutton for punishment and digging into this, but mm. you know it's kind of cathartic as well. Fully, fully, fully understanding why you yeah. feel so bad. <laughs> yeah. You'd, you'd I imagine. think that there's, there's yeah. some learnings to be taken here, aren't there? 
Yes. The first learning is if Jordan Smith could putt, he'd probably be a major champion by now. <laughs> yeah. uh, the second thing is if you're listening in the United States and Jordan Smith does get into the top 10 of these non-exempt rankings on the DP World Tour and gets a PGA Tour card, he's going to break your hearts if you're uh, one of these strokes <laughs> games oh, a, model a, mechanics because you, you can hear all the podcasts now. Next season, Kai, in 2024. Jordan Smith, Tita Green. He's elite. He's super elite. If he can only have a putting week. Yeah. If only. <laughs> Especially if you're only able to access win-only markets. Like, yep. the, he, he, it's, I mean, the thing is, like, on round one and round two, he's gained 1.3, 1. nearly 1.4 strokes game putting. So, the, you know, the pressure isn't on, but then the pressure comes on when the tournament's getting close. And it really just seems to screw up that, is either as either his reads or his stroke because there was just so many short putts that weren't really threatening the hole at all um or at least didn't look that way um in my biased viewpoint watching it on sunday he'll he'll this could be a catalyst for him to go to another put and you know another coach or a new coach or a putting specialist and if he can figure out how to be how that how to work that on the weekend oh, he's going to win you yeah. struggle to see him not winning twice a year with how well he hits the ball tee to green. I, we, I wonder if it's more of a mental thing than Barry than a me- mechanical thing because, as you just described, the first couple of days for a guy that hits the ball so well, the, for a guy that makes um, you know, from tee to green from mm. <clears throat> from his raw greens and re- regulation percentage is right up there. Um, when he's putting neutral or putting better than neutral as he was for the first couple of days. Um, then that's plenty good enough. Yeah. And you, you give Scotty Scheffler those kind of stats for the first two days on a on a an event, and you know again, likewise, he's he's absolutely romping it. Uh, and then mm-hmm. when push comes to shove, for whatever reason, the the body tightens or the it, mentally something just just doesn't quite work. The only time we've seen him do the complete opposite was at Villamora, where he shot uh, thirty under, whatever the number was. And uh, was holding absolutely everything, and uh, you know, just kind of harnessing a, a little bit of that, you know, th- those mental memories, and then uh, applying that when he finds himself in the position that he was on Sunday. Perhaps, uh, perhaps there's a job to be done there with someone, and because uh, there's, there's, there's an there's, immense there's amount of talent all, there. Yeah, there's something all right. I was watching um, a video of him. Peter Finch um, doing the pro-am at the BMW PGA and he was playing with Jordan Smith and he just seems like such a nice guy, which is why I'm lo- like I want to rip on him now, fully right now, but I can't. Um, mm. But he, he said at he said at one point through the round, like acknowledged like he's not a good putter. So you know, I suppose that's there's a good part of the battle there that he's mm. recognize you know he recognizes it. So now it's like how how to how to fix it. Um, and I suppose that's the the mystery of golf. Like, how do you make that thing just that little bit better? Yep. Yeah. Well, these guys aren't machines, are they? They're, you know, there's, there's human aspects in all of it, and um, it's it's a game of constant flux and constant change, and you've, you you're constantly battling all sorts of different elements and sparks of form and sparks of lack of form, and it's never ending. It's what fascinates us all the most, boys, eh? Keeps us on the edge of our chairs. DP World Tour rankings. So these are the non-exempt, yeah? PGA Tour. Fox at one now. Moronk two. Minwoo Louis three. Victor Perez four. Alexander Bjork five. It's top ten, isn't it? Non-exempt. So McIntyre's at six. Rio has jumped up to number seven with that victory. Mm. So could well be playing on the PGA Tour next year. He leapfrogs. Joost Lauten at eight. Yannick pulls up one spot to nine. And right on the bubble now, we have Tior Bjorn Olsen. Directly beneath him, Rasmus Hoygaard, who had a good week last week. Romain Langask. Thurston Lawrence, Jorge Campillo, and Jordan Smith. Right, let's talk Ryder Cup, shall we? That's why the listeners are here. Mm. They're here for our 
in-depth insight into the Ryder Cup. In terms of best bookmaker for the 2023 Ryder Cup, we're highlighting Bet365. They are currently offering these boosted prices on popular markets. Right. Tommy Fleetwood, top Euro point scorer, 15 to 2 from 13 to 2. Colin Morikawa, top USA point scorer, 10 to 1 from 17 to 2. Or if you like a correct point score bet, Europe 15, USA 13. That's been boosted from 12 to 1 to 14 to 1 with Bet 365. We recommend Bet365 if you are 18 plus and do not have a Bet365 sports account. You can find details of their current Bet £10, get £30 in free bets, new customer promotion, plus a link through to that very offer with T's and C's in this podcast description. Don't forget to use the bonus code SPORT30. That is SPORT30 when registering. Okay, right, Ryder Cup 2023. Paul, do you want to quickly... Take us through what we know about the Marco Simone course, please, because clearly you've covered this over a number of years at the Italian Open. Yeah, yeah, we have seen it for for three years now on the DP World Tour, so we have got a little bit of insight. Um, Marco Simone Golf Club is uh, 7,255 yard past 71. Uh, there was a big re, uh, well, redesign, renovation project, let's call it, um, ahead of the 2021 Italian Open. So we've had a chance to see it in its current guise three times now. That was with um, European Golf Design and Tom Fazio Jr. involved in that uh, that renovation. Parkland Course, water in play on a number of the holes. They relayed the greens as well as part of this renovation. Um, it's now creeping bent, bent grass um throughout on the on the putting surfaces a real mix of holes and i think this is a great venue for match play three par fives four par threes but we've got four sub 400 yard par fours Uh, and, and the finishing stretch again from a match play perspective you've got the 16th which is a 352 yard par four now when they've played this on the dp world tour that's tended to be the easiest par four on the course, um, and then you've got a 597 yard par five as the 18th hole, and of course they can chop and change where the uh, the T positions are for both of those holes to make um, the the 16th um, easier um, from a driving perspective, more more drivable, and certainly make the final hole uh, reachable in two should they want to. Um, which, from a match play perspective, tends to be the way that these kind of pivotal holes will play just to reward the uh, risk reward element so i think it's gonna be a cracking venue for this actually i must say um nothing in the uh, weather forecast while we're talking about the, uh, the the course nothing in the forecast to suggest there's going to be anything untoward it actually looks set fair throughout for the uh, for three days virtually no wind 28 29 centigrade so that's kind of low 80s Fahrenheit. So there's nothing, um, there's not going to be any reason to, to kind of favour one uh, type of player over another in terms of the, how the, the weather forecast sets up. So that's the course itself. Um, I have got some some stats from the, the players that have won here. So I can run through that now if you uh, want me to do it that way. Still. Yeah, definitely. Crack on, mate. Um. So since the revamp, we've got uh, we've had three winners: Nikolai Hoygaard, uh, Robert McIntyre, and Adrian Moronk earlier this year. So with those three names, all three of them hit it a reasonable distance. Uh, Nikolai's the the longest of the three, but all three of them can put it out there. They're well over three hundred yards average. The the trio. Uh, in terms of raw stats. Um, it's a bit of a mix, really. Moronk was ninth for driving accuracy. Hoygaard and McIntyre were much further down the field. All of the guys who won were top 20 for greens in regulation. The one stat, from a traditional stat perspective, that sticks out with these three winners was scrambling. Hoygaard and Moronk both, both led the field for scrambling on the week. And if you look a little bit further down the, uh, the, the field and some of the contenders who were 
uh, performing well over those weeks as well. Fleetwood, um, back in 2021, he finished uh, runner-up. He was eighth for scrambling. Moronk that year, fifth for scrambling. Um, in 2022, five of the top 10 were all inside the top 10 for scrambling. Uh, earlier this year, Roman Langask, who was third for scrambling as well, he was right up there. So um, having a decent short game. And if you listen to some of the commentaries, listen to some of the um, the people on the ground in Rome who've seen the course, it would suggest that it's going to be really quite tough around the greens. So having a good short game may well be something to to focus on this week. And the course itself is certainly not a pushover. Um, Ronk won at 13 under, McIntyre 14 under, Nikolai won at 13 under. So, you know, the, the guys are only just getting into um, double figures under par just beyond that. Um, so it's not a pushover. I think plenty of holes are going to be won here with par this week. So certainly something to consider in terms of kind of mindset, I guess. We do have some strokes gain stats. Uh, Huygard and Moronk were both first for strokes gain off the tee and were both first for strokes gain tee to green. So again, if you're going to pick some uh, statistics to kind of run against your players and see who, who might go well, which teams may be best suited, then strokes gain off the tee, strokes gain tee to green and scrambling around the greens would be the uh, the ones to consider, I think. But um, yeah, as, as, as a little overview, I think that's um, kind of where you should be pitching your thought processes um, to start this week, I would say. Barry, can I ask you, thoughts on the course, and then secondly, your thoughts on the two respective teams and their lineups? I mean, we, what do we have, like four hours for me to talk through all that? <laughs> well, of course, really, you know, what are your thoughts around the course and, and what kind of style of play it might suit? And then just some general views on Team Europe versus Team USA and you know just the way that we've got to this point in terms of selections and whatever. Um... There's pod, there are podcasts such as the Fried Egg who will go through the architecture and design of this course far better than I could with years of study. So I would encourage anybody who wants to approach it um, or listen deeper on that <clears throat> to to go hunt them down there. Um, the first thing about the design of this course was it was all done for the stadium style of viewing, um, mm-hmm. a la Sawgrass, which which means that people will be able to see many, many holes from many, many locations. But mm. some argue that it's compromised a little bit of its design or made its design a little bit funky in spots or, you know, maybe not the optimal from an architecture, golf course architecture point of view. But if that, you know, when it comes to the Ryder Cup, that's not the most important thing. You need a venue where the fans are there because they're part of the event. So... In terms of that, it looks like it's really going to nail it, um, and it's it's going to have quite a bit of drama the way the final holes kind of set up on it. Um, it's it's always hard to say, and we can get sucked into the the social media the week before an event, um, particularly when the majors come along with people dropping balls in the rough and you know. It, it, Everyone starts like losing their run themselves and running, you know, panicking and oh my god, it's crazy. But th- this course has, over the last couple of um, showings, proven itself to be quite a challenge tee to green, and the rough is quite healthy. Um, the grass is quite healthy and grippy, and so if you're yeah. missing, if you're missing your fairways and you're missing your greens, you are going to have to work your ass off to to not drop a shot. So, in terms of what it's going to get, you know, ask of the players this week, I think it's going to be quite a challenge across all the different elements of anybody's game: off the tee, approach, short game, um, putting. Putting will be interesting. They're <clears throat> they're quite undulating. They can get very fast. Yeah. So. Mm. Um, I guess when it comes to putting, they will probably try find the 
speed of greens that best suits the Europeans. If that's a, like, mm. and, and, yeah. and you can be da- you can be damn sure they've analysed that uh, to yeah, the nth yeah. degree. Um, Donald is extremely detail oriented, so it could be a case of them setting the greens to ten foot six instead of eleven foot, and that I could be right, definitely that could be yeah, a tiny definitely. tiny difference. You know, it, mm-hmm. could, it could just make point one or point two of a strokes gains yeah. putting per player per round. That could be the difference in one hole here and one hole there, and that's and those are the fine margins upon which you miss the Ryder Cup. Mm. So, I, look, I, th- there's no doubt that the course will have been set up and massaged into a way that should be beneficial to the European skill sets. That's and that's assuming everything follows a very smooth bell curve on how we play and how they play um, for every different metric that they've analysed going into this week. But I think it's going to be it's going to be it won't be just like a you know it won't be just a birdie fest uh, all over the place. I think it's going to make for an interesting view you know interesting viewing in that the guys are going to have to perform quite well this week. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to see quite a few holes one with pars, but. You know that's part of golf where you have to sometimes scramble to try make par, and that's those recovery shots can be exciting to watch as well, rather than just pure birdies. So I'm like, mm-hmm. in a roundabout way, like I'm kind of looking forward to how the way the course should play, in theory, based on everything we've been fed so far. Yeah. From what you uh, say, it's interesting that that point relates the point that you made relates completely to what Paul said earlier about scrambling being so important in those three victories around him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in an event where kind of 13 unders winning um, and it's really quite consistent, suggests the course is really quite consistent, but also mm-hmm. the the requirements are uh, you know, consistent from year to year. If it's been set up slightly tougher, um, which would be the implication, then, um, yeah, you know, if the guys were going out there and playing a stroke play event, would we be looking at a, a 10 under kind of winning total and you're kind of getting into a technical course category for a uh, for a, for a parkland track which um yeah I, it, it'll be fascinating to see how they've uh, they've set it up and what advantages that could potentially bring the european team um, which of course is the, the the whole purpose of having it set up in a certain uh, fashion for the home uh, for the home hosts How should we look at this from a betting perspective? Because I have to say, don't take me the wrong way here, the Ryder Cup is never my favourite betting event, even though it's my joint favourite golf event with the Masters. So I always find it's an event where you can throw a lot of money at it and get no reward because there's so many different markets to go through and so many different ways of skinning cats. Mm. Um. I'll, I'll tell you, one point that I've looked at, and I know it's a popular market, is overall top point scorer. So throw all the uh, t- throw all the, the players into the hat. Who's going to actually earn the most points across the whole event? Yeah. I've looked into this. Montgomery at the Belfry in 2 Westwood and Garcia... Both tied top point scorer at Oakland Hills in 04 and the Clay Club in 06. Poulter, Valhalla, 08. Celtic Manor was a bit of a weird one because, if you remember, it was shortened because of tremendous amounts of rain. Donald, Poulter, Stricker and Woods all were joint top point scorer. Mm. Then Medina, 2012, Poulter. Glen Eagles, 2014, Rose. Hazeltine, 2016, this was a crazy one. Team USA won 17-11. Thomas Peters was the top point scorer at 50-1 to for yeah. Team Europe yeah, remember that. as a rookie. Frankie Molinari, of course, at the Golf National. Last time this was held in Europe, 2018, 22-1. Top point scorer odds. And last year... Dustin John, uh, last time, sorry, at Whistling Straits, twenty twenty one. Dustin Johnson, twelve to one with bet three six five. So, if we're going to kind of put a synopsis on that, a Team Europe player has been top point scorer across nine of the past ten Ryder Cups. 
Caveats, Donald and Poulter shared with Woods and Stricker in the shortened 2010 Celtic Manor renewal. DJ was five from five at Whistling Straits in 2021. So a Team Europe player has been top overall point scorer across the last five consecutive home rider cups. Of course, there is that caveat with Woods and Stricker at Celtic Manor. So that's quite quite a pointed number, isn't it? Five consecutive home rider cups a Team Europe player has been top overall point scorer. Yeah. And I, I think if you dig through the stats with this, and um, there's, there's plenty on the site for you to pour through this week, um, it tends to be that the Team Europe um, mentality is more aligned to giving some of the superstars five out of five games. So to start with, they've got a better chance of actually being the overall top point scorer because they are most likely to play more games. Um, last time, Dustin Johnson, five out of five. Um, you know, you've, you'd have to go far, a long, a long way down to find players that are going to be playing five out of five generally with the, the team USA, USA team. A lot of the times you're looking at three or four games max for... For the uh, for the the team USA, I, there was an, I don't know if any of you guys caught the um, press conference yesterday, but uh, mm. someone asked Luke Donald very specifically, um, "How are you going to manage that? Are you going to have players that are playing five out of five, and are you going to potentially have players that don't feature at all until the Sunday singles?" Um, and he, he he did think about his answer for a few seconds. It wasn't just a kind of off the cuff knee jerk reaction, and. Um, the implication again from that was yes, there are likely to be players that will be playing five out of five, um, and um, kind of with a wry smile, he, he was suggesting that there wouldn't be someone who didn't play anything until Sunday. But with that smile, it kind of suggested to me that there may be one or two who might only get one outing up yeah. until that point. Yeah, kind I, of. I, but- but you, you, and you have to change. I mean, you're going to have to change your plans a little bit on the fly. Like, I mean, you, you, as much as he could lay out everything he thinks he can do throughout the week, like things are going to change. Like, players might show up on Wednesday evening and be just hitting it awful, or mm. and, you know, there's you have to, you know, there, there's got to be some you know flexibility and adaptation on the fly. Um, I definitely got the feeling that, uh, yeah. A couple of yeah, one or two will only get one run, one game before Sunday. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of kind of what I kind of what I drew out of that. And um, just to put those numbers into a bit of context, Dustin Johnson was the only player who who played five out of five last time for the team for Team USA. Uh, if you go back through Rory McIlroy's record, for instance, he's missed just two games from six Ryder Cups, so he's played twenty eight out of thirty games. So in general, Rory has played five out of five. Justin Rose has missed two games from five Ryder Cups, so 23 from 25. So in general, Justin Rose has played five out of five. Hovland last time played five out of five. Didn't win, didn't get... He got a couple of points, didn't he? A couple of halves, but didn't uh, didn't win an event. John Rahm last time played five out of five. He was the top scorer for Team Europe. Um, three out, three and a half out of five. Um, but he was playing with Sergio Garcia all the way through, and of course we uh, we know mm-hmm. the uh, the story with Sergio. So uh, yeah, I think if you're going to look at that market, then you do need to look at it with your your eyes open, I guess, as to how yeah. or who is likely to get the most uh, most game time. Yeah. It doesn't shout Robert McIntyre a hundred to one <laughs> yeah. with Bet three six five. It has to be said. I tell you what, let, I'm tell you what, that takes me on to something I've got here on my, on my particular sheet that I that I pulled together. Both of you have mentioned thick, lush, rough, and we certainly saw that at Wentworth a couple of weeks ago. And we discussed on the pod last week. We didn't think that that was just some random. Mm. We we think that's all part of the process. They 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 definitely set Wentworth up with thicker, lusher rough than we've seen in well, in my memory. And I think that's a logical step with Donald yeah. wanting to 
to get all of his 12 players at Wentworth playing. And I'll tell you what I just want to do. I want to go through those Wentworth groups because there could be a definite clue in or two in there about who's going to be playing with who. Right. McElroy played with Aberg, or was it? What is it? What's it? Was it Oberg? No. O- yeah, Ober. Ober. Yeah, Ober. So Macaroy, Ober, <laughs> and Hovland. <laughs> then we had Fleetwood, Lowry, Stracker, Rose, Fitzpatrick, McIntyre. See that that group there makes a lot of sense for me when you're saying Paul Rose has only missed two games in all of his Ryder Cup yeah, career. Yeah. I think Rose is going to see a lot of action. And it's likely to be with Fitzpatrick. And then we've got Ram. And we saw this group on the tee, and they were having the time of their lives. Ram, Nikolai, Nikolai Hoygaard, and Tyrrell Hatton. I'm yeah. pretty certain Ram and, Ram and Hatton are going to be paired together. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Now, t- from a Team USA perspective, we can't have any of this chat, but they've already announced the USA press conference uh, um, set up and schedule and Team USA are coming in pairs for a lot of them and these are the pairs Cantley Chauflay surprise surprise Spieth Thomas surprise surprise Burns Scheffler <laughs> Max Homer Morikawa so I don't think there's too many surprises there but I can definitely see John Rahm and Tyrrell Hatton being a spearhead team. I've, uh, there's been a lot of chat about Ober and where he fits into this, and and you could see him going out with the big dog like McElroy. Yeah, I think, Ho- I think, Hovland, I think Ober of the, of the I think Ober of the rookies is going to see a lot of action because we just know his game is elite off the tee. It's long and it's straight, and it just makes perfect sense for this mm-hmm. golf course. So if you if you can throw the, that information into your computer and then try and get top point score into the top point scorer market, I think there's there's something to take from all of that. I've also got just Ryder Cup win percentages to throw out there as well. Um, Team Europe, Rose heads at fifty seven percent across his career, Ryder Cup. Fleetwood and Rahm fifty percent. McElroy 43%, Larry 33%, Hatton 29%, and as you mentioned earlier, Paul, to, uh, at this point, Victor Hovland hasn't won a Ryder Cup event, 0%, and nor has Matt Fitzpatrick. And he's been at two Ryder Cups from memory. Yeah, lost five from five matches. Team USA Ryder Cup win percentages. Cantley, Morikawa, Zander, 75%. Bearing in mind, they've only played one each. Scheffler and Thomas at 67%. That's the number a lot of people throw out there, of course, with JT struggling with his game, but he's got such a great Ryder Cup record, which is true. Kepka, 50%. Slightly underwhelming for a player of Kepka's um, um, clear pedigree in the top of top level events. Then we've got Spieth at 44 and Ricky Fowler, 20% Ryder Cup win percentage. Mm. Wow. Yeah, a lot of halves in there for Ricky over the years. Hmm. Anything that jumps to jumps into your mind from any of that, Barry? You've caught me completely off guard. I was thinking about something else, Steve. I'm just gonna take a pass. Could you send that over to Paul? <laughs> Really he's he's, uh, he, he's working out what, what, he's, he's working out his uh, telephone schedule for the day. Yeah, I, I think I think I think Barry's still running through Jordan Smith's um, card from last. Week. <laughs> he's still going with what Miss three footer, Miss two and a half. Oh yeah, he's, he's, I was off he's, looking he's, at some odds. And I was completely <laughs> in another planet. This is the beauty of recording live and in one take. You end up with some crap like this. <laughs> Um, I, numbers just, that just j- numbers that jumped out to me were Fleetwood fifty percent win ratio, and you can back him right now. Top event point scorer with Coral at sixteen to one, 
and it that those win percentages just really really concern me from an american perspective when you've got on course captain jordan spieth at 44% and ricky fowler who clearly got a captain's pick and is part of part of you know part of the furniture at a 20% mm. yeah big weaknesses there for me yeah yeah, it's 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 a it's a tricky market because I I think with with the Ryder Cup in general, it's it, ultimately it's a two horse race, and you're trying to find value in this two horse race in some way, some capacity, some side market, and um, yeah. you know I haven't had I haven't had a bet in this this market because I I can't I haven't found something yet. We've just talked it through and um. My eye has been drawn to Justin Rose as a result of the conversation we've just had, because he has generally played a lot of matches, as I say, twenty three out of twenty five. If you look through his record, and we've got this on our um, event stats sheet, from the five Ryder Cups that he's played, in this overall point score score market, he's finished third, second, first, then ninth and seventh. You can get him thirty three to one each way, four places. Yeah. And in the three of his five Ryder Cups, he will have played paid out as the winner on one occasion and each way on another two occasions. And if we were to hypothesise that he will be playing a minimum of four matches, then he's in a good spot yeah. to, uh, to to go and push on and uh, potentially appear in that market again. Perhaps mm. I've just talked myself into it. A Rose and Fitzpatrick... Um spearhead group uh, team if you like does, would not shock you would it just based mm. upon what we saw and you know you, you might be throwing McIntyre in there for a four ball yeah as Ro- Rose as the senior player with and one so, of yeah, yeah, yeah one yeah. of the two I can see that so I think you're going to get some bang for your buck with that bet with Rose aren't you just based upon his history and also just trying to foresee what Luke's going to do with him yeah He's going to be he's going to be seeing plenty of the course over the three days. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I think a lot of people think mm, he's not been playing that great, Rose. But actually, just looking at the numbers and looking at what happens in the past and what's likely to happen with Donald's selections, I think there there is some value in that. I t- the the one I am going to take in that market, and I'm only taking one. I am going to take Tommy Fleetwood. Yeah. So I've I've taken that sixteen to one with Coral top event point scorer, and I I'll take it each way because four four spots in that at full quarter of the odds on the yeah, each yeah. way. Yeah. Um, he's only seen this golf course once. He finished second, and it's a bit like your situation you've had recently with Rio um, Barry, and you've been talking about him for a number of weeks on the podcast, and you've been backing him, and of course. The one event you don't back him, he wins. Uh, I should um, be clear, I didn't back him the last couple either, but it, it's just... But it's something, it's a player you've had on your yeah, radar for yeah, sure. Yeah. I've been mentioning Tommy Fleetwood, I was on a tour championship on a lot mm-hmm. of events recently. I was on him, um, I mentioned him at Wentworth, and then he was contending, he was in the last group, wasn't he? He's playing some great golf. I can just see we we had the history with him and, and um, Francesco at the at um, mm. the last European held event at the Golf National. So yeah, sixteen to one. I'm taking top point scorer market uh, for Tommy Fleetwood. Mm. Any interest? I'm trying to keep my bets light, but that's that's one I've definitely taken. Yeah. Any interest at all from a a, a USA player in this market? Do you reckon? Do you think? Do you think? And do you think a Team USA player will get five games? Do you think there's one out there? Is it? Is it a Scotty Scheffler who is? You know, he, he heads this market, so there's an implication mm. that um, the bookies think if there's one player that is more likely than others to get uh, more action and to win is Scotty Scheffler. But imagine Scotty. Scotty goes out um, on on Friday and putts abysmally in that first. Uh, well, they, they're playing foursomes, aren't they? Yeah. I think, aren't they? Force was on Friday, for- yeah. It's an interesting way to to start as well. Um, yeah, just looking at your yeah, he, he could easily get benched, right? If he puts yeah, shit absolutely. in the first round, yeah, yeah. 
Just look in your Team USA sheet, Paul. Mm. Average matches played. Spieth and Thomas, 4.5. Yep. Kepka, Cantley, Morikawa, Zander, 4. Ricky, 3.75. Scotty, 3. He was a rookie. Hadn't won on the PGA Tour at that point. Could you see Max Homer playing five? Because he's playing some great golf at the moment. I, do you know I can't likely to be paired with Colin Morikawa, who's going to find fairway after fairway after fairway after fairway. Yeah, I I would think I would have Xander as a play if Xander's playing in any way well at, coming into it. Um, I'd expect to see Xander playing at least four matches. Yeah, Just, because it's it's that kind of test and grind the the way the course feels like it's going to play that. Mm really kind of goes into Xander's wheelhouse. You know, that, that not quite saying it's US Open, but he can he can just get his grind on and just be, be always scoring well when the <clears throat> courses are presenting a, a a little bit extra level of challenge from the usual tour weeks. Yeah. Now, whether that converts into him making, um, you know, getting a lot of points. But, oh, yeah, yeah, this is it. Is that's that's the that's the that's the trickier question. Like so, yeah, you've got it's a two parter. You know, who's going to play loads of games and you know, do do they actually win points? Then, mm. yes, a tricky one to try and uh, try and work through. I wouldn't. I mean, if I'd expect a European to top the points, you know, uh, most points one market. But that doesn't necessarily mean Europe are going to win. You know, it, 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 those two you know can exist at the same time. So I think if I was going to back like a Xander in the top points market, it would be in the top US points market only. Well, um, yeah, this is it. You've got all the kind of subdivided markets from this that sit mm-hmm. below this. So um, there's different ways to, to play it for sure. I just, feel, I just feel like one of the Europeans is just going to catch fire with the crowd and just be untouchable during the week. Whether mm. you know all those points results in the European win, you know, it remains to be seen. Yeah. Yep. How is Sepp Straka so disrespected? Like, it's, <laughs> in every market he's in, the man is just pushed to the bottom. But again, is this is there an assumption here that um, yeah. the McIntyre and Straka are gonna gonna mm. play? It's gonna be bit part players in this. Um, you know, as Luke Donald goes out and um, kind of almost ruthlessly tries to, uh, to 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 navigate through to a win at the end. I mean, it's Matt, but it's Matt. When you think, arguably, like Straka's playing better than Larry, and then the last mm. few months better than Rose, like, and yet they're ahead of him in the betting market and probably going to play more matches than he is. I don't know what that guy. He, He'll probably win a major, Straka, with, and nobody will know. <laughs> They'll just forget yeah. that it happened. <laughs> yeah, just just write it off. Yeah, no, that was an odd result. Move on. Next one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, dear. Scotty Scheffler, 9-2. to two, Cantlay, 6-1. to one, Xander, 13-2. to two, Top USA point score, if you're going down that route. You've got eight to one Morikawa, and then nine to one Kepka and Homer. I tell you, there's there's a there's a market that kind of chops um, into that a little bit further that <clears throat> I've got a bet in, which is the okay. top US wild card market. So with this, you've got uh, Kepka, Morikawa, Spieth, Thomas, Fowler, Burns as the six. And I've taken Jordan Spieth in that at five to one. Now, Spieth is the third favourite in that market behind in in the order that I read through, Kepka, Morikawa and Spieth. Now, Spieth's coming into this. um, We just described his record in terms of um, matches played, four and a half uh, generally, so he's played 18 from 20 matches um, over the years. So historically, he's got a lot of t- a lot of game time. Um, I think, in terms of the guile and the um, imagination, you may well need um, recovery shots that you may well need this week. Spieth's 
got more of that about him than much of the uh, much of the US team. Uh, Nappy Factor, of course, um, welcomed their baby daughter into the world um, recently. The Spieths, congratulations to those guys. Um, I think Spieth's going to be an important part of the team this week. And if there's a market that I think that he could top, then um, I think that's it. Top wild card. Um, I, Fowler and Burns potentially getting. I, I don't know. I may. I, I might be wrong. They they may get four or five matches, but it I doesn't quite feel that way to me. Justin Thomas has been out of form unless he's found something magical. Kepka, Kepka tops that market, um, and he's hardly been pulling trees up on the uh, on the live tour and joined the team separately. Um, yeah, is he kind of going to be? I don't know. I, I I'll be interested to see the team dynamics with Kepka and um and the, and the rest of the US team. Um, perhaps it will be one big happy family. Um, I, I'm not entirely convinced in that. So but for me, it's between Kepka. Oh, sorry, it's between Spieth and Morikawa. And uh, at five to one, I'll take a chance on Spieth personally. The thing that concerns me with Team USA is is firstly Zach Johnson. Hmm. I don't really need to go into much more detail, I think, with that comment. But it's almost as if it's a team now that's run by the team rather than the captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's gone that they, they with this with this um, <laughs> with the way that now that basically it's all about that. All they keep mentioning is they always wanted to recreate the European team spirit with their, you know, the task force and you've got all the experienced pros in there, Tiger, Jim Fury, you've got Davis Love. It's all, they all, they constantly talk about the team, but it's almost got to the stage now where the team is picking who's playing with each other, mm. who's in the team and who's going to be playing in what matches. And yeah. Zach's kind of just sitting there like a, Bit of a wobbly head, just going through it at press conferences. Did you, uh, just to pick up on that? I listening to that press conference yesterday, and perhaps perhaps I listened to it, and perhaps the way I interpreted it was a little bit out of context. But Zach was talking about his role being someone who organises beds and uh, uh, and massages and stuff like that for the players when they need. It. <laughs> and it's like, you know, for me. That, that, that he should be the inspiration. He should be the guy who's um, inspiring his team of twelve to go out there and mm. um, and, and and win the Ryder Cup. Um, not someone yeah. who who's got the booking form for the spa. It just doesn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it just didn't. And as I say, perhaps I've taken that, or perhaps I've interpreted that out of context. But that's kind of how it felt to me. There's a fantastic high performance podcast that Jake, um, I don't, uh, Jake, is it Jake Humphreys has pulled together? You know, it's a very popular podcast, and he's got McGinley, Donald, and one other on there. Came out yesterday. Well worth a listen. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to. I've, I've literally listened to the first five minutes. I'm gonna listen to the whole of it today on Tuesday when we after I've recorded this. But that's you get a lot of insight into the depth of thought that's going into this from a Team Europe perspective. Uh, this just takes me to my main bet of the week, and I, 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 I punted on this six, seven weeks ago. I have gone very, very heavy. It's a blended rate. I've had a couple of bets. It blends out at 29 to 20, so 2.45 decimal. I've just gone straight Europe victory. Mm. And do you know what? With that bet and with Fleetwood as a bit of an interest from the top point score, I'm just going to leave it, I think. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Just for the record, last three results when they've played full 28 matches, yeah, Ryder Cups hosted in Europe. 2006 K Club, Europe 18.5, USA 9.5. 2014 Glen Eagles. Europe 16 and a half, USA 11 and a half. And the Golf National 2018, Europe 17 and a half, USA 10 and a half. Mm. Now, by my rudimentary, rudimentary mathematics, that is a nine point victory at the K Club, a five point victory at Glen Eagles, and a seven point victory at the Golf National. 
and that just uh, that just from what I felt, what I've seen, what I've heard, I, I've been Team Europe on this for a long while now, so I, I'm happy with that bet. There might be something in there that says as well, and there are some margin markets out there where you could take Europe. I don't know a four to six points victory. I'm seeing eleven to two out there. Europe to win by four to six points. I don't see this being a 15 13. Nor, nor the bet 365 based upon their boosted uh, boosted prices that they're offering. <laughs> yeah, always be And they're never the wide of the mark, really, are they? No, no, no. You'd have to, do, you'd have to take Don't note forget of Europe 15, USA 13, overall correct point score. They boosted 12 to 1 out to 14 to 1. Now, you could look at that and say, well, actually, they, they clearly think that USA have got a real squeak here. I think it's the other way. I think that Bet365 and their odds compilers think that actually it could be Europe winning by more. And that's just an historical thing, isn't it? When you're, mm-hmm. when you're literally saying we've won by nine points, five points and seven points over the last three yeah. renewals when it's been a, a, a full schedule Ryder Cup. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there might be something in that as well. But they're my two bets: Europe to win, Tommy Fleetwood top combined point score of sixteen to one. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm on Europe five to four bet Fred. Um, I didn't get the early prices as as, as you have, but um, as it's got closer to the day, I've become more convinced that the uh, the European team will win. And um, yeah, quite happy to take that on. The the only other bet I've got is in the um, top European rookie market, which is um, a market of four. Uh, Ludwig Ober, Nikolai Hoegaard. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we're going to need like... We've heard we, so many pronunciations of that as well, yeah. tr- trying to investigate it. We're, <laughs> and we're going to say it wrong every time and differently. We, we're going to need like a swear box, aren't we? So every What's time your pronunciation, Barry? Because weren't you talking to someone from Sweden? <laughs> No, I went on I went on Google and just got it to play a couple of variations of people speaking it, and they were both different. And then you said you found another one. So that's three completely distinct ways of pronouncing his name that we've heard on top of it's, the way we get it pumped in through the TV where everybody says Aberg, which is, I just blame the US commentators for being lazy and not figuring it out in the first place and just, and just grabbing whatever pronunciation they wanted to apply to it instead of yeah, figuring it out, but I, I don't know. So hopefully, someone asks him this week on TV. Yes. How do you pronounce your name, Ludwig? Yeah, I think we could just call yeah. him Ludwig because there's no uh, ambiguity there. There's, oh, there's not another perfect. Ludwig out there, is there, for us to mm. uh, to get him confused with? With um, yeah, in that market, Ludwig, uh, Nikolai Hoygaard, Stracker, McIntyre. I I think going back to the point you made, Steve. I think he's in this um, kind of mini pod potentially with Rory, potentially with uh, Victor Hovland I've seen uh, banded around quite a bit. And if one of those pairings sticks and works very early on, I think Ludwig could have quite a lot of game time. He's 13 to 8 to be the top European rookie. And I think he's got a very strong chance of making that happen this week. So, um, yes, I've taken that. And opposing Nikolai Nikolai Hoygaard, Stracker, and McIntyre in that market, effectively. Mm. I can say that. Mm. What bits have you had, Baron? None yet. Um, from a few weeks ago, I got it in my head to kind of look at some betting on the exact score for a European win in and around the the fifteen Europe scoring, like you know, fourteen and a half to kind of sixteen range. Um, mm-hmm. there's a, there's been a lot of, um, information out there in the last couple of weeks. So that I've digested that I've shown. And again, here this morning that European, when Europe, you know, wins in Europe, it's usually by a significant margin and which is making me rethink that whole approach to the bet or that angle. So, um, I'm, I may end up just doing a Europe only win um or Europe win only. I'm trying to figure out who uh, the top point score mark of the European like pick one or two of the Europeans for that I think will be my approach. I'm wondering like 
Tyrrell Hatton's been playing very well, and that's kind of a nice enough price there. You can get him at 20s. Mm. I'm just wondering if his fiery demeanor would get him enough um, matches under Luke Donald's captaincy. Well, I think he's going to play a lot with Rahm, which makes that 20 to 1 very attractive. Mm. Could You can see that, can't you? Fire and fire. And we saw them at Wentworth. They were having a right old time with Nikolai Hoygaard on the tee there at 11. Just You could see the banter. Yeah. Hatton hit a good shot into there, didn't he? And, and Rahm was literally high-fiving. A great shot, Tyrrell. There's, there's clearly a chemistry there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if they win the foursomes match, uh, they go out together and win the foursomes match on Friday morning. Um, They're straight mm-hmm. out the afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. Are yeah, they? Why are they going to split them up? Are they droppable? Probably not. No. So yeah, I can see that. I think what you've got to ask yourself, especially when you when you're looking at with the winning margin potentially for Europe, is is there anything we are seeing from selections? from Zach Johnson, the way that the Americans have pulled their team together, the way that they've travelled over here, the way that they haven't played golf competitively for a number of weeks. Is there anything different that suggests that they won't get defeated by anything less than five points, which was what we saw at Glen Eagles in 2014? Because from there, it's five, seven and nine, the, the, the victory. So is there anything that we've seen that suggests that actually it's going to be far tighter than five points? And when I just go through it all, I don't see anything that's any different. I really don't. No, but we've got blue tinted glasses on as well. Mm. Like we've been we've been in the Europe pro European echo chamber for a few months now. So everything just gets every one of your little ideas and biases gets like pushed even more to the extreme and I want I want it to be close as well because it makes for more exciting viewing. Um, it mm. it does feel though that things are heavily in our favour at the moment. And USA are the betting favourites, marginally. Yeah. yeah, marginally. Do you see that actually changing before the off, or do you think it's, it's going to pretty much stay as it is? I, it's, where it's been it's been getting closer and closer, and yeah. yeah. It's going to be super tight. It may not shift a great deal from where we are now because I'm not convinced that what the weight of money is on that outright market. But um, yeah, it's mm. there's, there's nothing in it, is there? Very, very little. Yeah. Tweet your bets out, Barrett Barry. Once you've actually had, uh, when, when you've sat and mulled and chewed and got to the point of where you're happy with. Them. Really? Because I picked, like, effectively the way I backed everything last week, I had three losers. So, <laughs> <laughs> if I had backed this, this Jordan way, Smith situation, the Jordan Smith with, syndrome. Yeah. It's broken it's, your it's Barry, a mental it? block here for Barry, isn't it? I can, I can see. He's a broken man. <laughs> Jordan Smith's putting has totally broken you as well. Oh. oh. Is that us then? Is that the Ryder Cup pod complete, do you think? Yeah, there's nothing else. I think we just got to sit back and enjoy it. And it's as a as a viewing spectacle, it's a fantastic week and very much looking forward to the build up to it and uh, the three days of action. Mm. It should be a cracker. Should be a corker. My wife hates it. It's just me sitting in front of the TV watching golf for three days. She absolutely she struggles with it, but well, at least it's during the day, Steve. At least it's during yeah. the day. It's during the day. It's only it's only once every two years. Yeah. <laughs> Steve's eight cans deep by the time <laughs> the, the <laughs> afternoon session's finished. Yeah, yeah it's no use to. Yeah, that, that's yeah. another thing. I do not get inv- I do not bet on matches. I refuse to just. This is it. I'd rather sit there and watch it with a couple of bets sprinkled on it than that. Then just. Oh, you know, I'm going to bet such and such to beat such and such. You know. See, I love I doing know. that, putting on like a, no, a, a multi-match accumulator. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy to do, isn't it? Yeah. And so easy to lose that as well. Mm. Absolutely. Well, Barry, I hope your bets go well once you've actually decided what they are. And Paul, I hope your bets go well. Yeah, and yourself. You too, boys. 
Enjoy the Ryder Cup, of course. I hope uh, the listeners' bets go go well and you enjoy the Ryder Cup to its full extent. We're back next week with two events. We're back on PGA Tour and DP World Tour duty. Uh, Paul, I believe you've got the St Andrews, what is it, the, um, uh, Dunhill the Alfred Links, yeah. Dunhill Links. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Look forward to that. That's always a great event on the DP mm. World Tour. And I've got the Sanderson Farms Championship in the, uh, in the southern United States to get stuck into. So look forward to that. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Cheerio. If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved with all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf